So um, alpha hemolysis, we said, was um, streptococcus mutans, um, streptoco streptococcus pneumonia. Beta hemolysis, the three pathogens we mentioned, were streptococcus pyogenes. And what can streptococcus pyogenes cause? Strep throat, right? And folks, this is really, to me, it's just fascinating, right? So I did a throat swab on myself, and I had these little beta hemolytic colonies. And I was all excited. <coughs> I was like, oh, I think I have strep throat. This is perfect, you know, for the class. Um, but I went to the doctor yesterday. They did a rapid strep test, and they said it didn't come back as streptococcus pyogenes, but they're sending it for culture, right? But the reason, folks, that I was thinking I might have strep throat is do you see on, again, folks, these are sample plates, and, and probably at that distance you can't see. But if you come up, you guys, and hold the plates up to the light, you'll see that there's areas of total clearing of the auger. So what kind of hemolysis is that? That's no. beta hemolysis, right? And so if it's a throat swab, you know, we're thinking streptococcus pyogenes. Another possibility might be, folks, I was thinking of this, is that if we're colonizing our nose with Staphylococcus aureus, which is also beta hemolytic, I was thinking there is a possibility maybe from like post-nasal drip, maybe you are getting some Staph aureus in the back of the throat. So maybe we're picking up some, some beta hemolytic Staph aureus maybe. We can do a gram stain and find out just based on cell arrangement, okay? So you guys, so um, beta hemolytic streptococcus pyogenes, beta hemolytic staphylococcus aureus, right? And what's the other one that we worry about in our pregnant patients? Group B strep, right? Also beta hemolytic. And why do we worry about group B strep, folks? Yeah, right. If you have a vaginal delivery and mom's colonized and the vaginal mucosa, the baby can become infected, and sometimes it can lead to neonatal sepsis and meningitis. So certainly all pregnant women should be screened, have vaginal swabs done on the vaginal mucosa, be screened for group B strep. Can treat, can treat them easily with antibiotics, right? And the same thing with strep throat, you guys, it's easily treated with antibiotics. Yeah. Um, yeah, that is such a great question. So, it, and I'm probably going to give you too much information, but I'll do it anyway. So, initially, it was considered a veterinary pathogen of cattle, right? So, and it infects the mammary gland, so it's shed in milk. So, maybe, maybe at some point, you know, people were drinking raw milk, maybe, and passed in the intestinal tract, and then women got colonized. Then, it wasn't known as a human pathogen until about maybe maybe 30 or 40 years ago, it's kind of an emerging human pathogen. So it, it, can, um, it can be transmitted, like if, if a woman is colonized, a man can become colonized, so intimate contact, mucus to mucus contact, right? So if mom, if mom has it and is treated with antibiotics, she can get recolonized again, so that's why you're probably screening all the way up to the time of delivery. Um, with regard to it being foodborne, that I don't know about. Um, I, I'm guessing probably initially that's how it happened, right? But I don't know nowadays, like especially if you're drinking pasteurized milk, milk should no longer be a source of it. So that's a really, it's a really good question. Yeah, that's interesting. Like, 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 Right, right. It's it's probably certainly like if, if people are colonized on the mucous mem membranes of the genital tract, and this can be men and women, certainly when you're intimate, it can be transferred, right? Um, but again, unless you're drinking raw milk, I don't see how milk would be a source of it anymore. That's such a great question. But Jesse, thank you so much because um, that's such a good point. If you're group B, if you're group B strep positive is, is a mom, it's not a big deal because just that, you can be given antibiotics during delivery and the streptococcus, the genus streptococcus, they're really sensitive to antibiotics, just like penicillin, right? So it's just known ahead of time. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Okay. Okay, folks, so that's, um, we've got our, we've got our um, um, nose swabs and throat swabs up here. We've double bagged them, you guys, because what have we done in growing? Those little darling pathogens on our blood auger, what have we done? We've amplified them, right? So we don't want you opening the bags. You know, hold them up to the light so you can see the different types of homolysis. 
And certainly, folks, when you're finished, even, I mean, I'm uber, uber cautious about this stuff. As soon as you even just, you know, look at them here, make sure you wash your hands. And because, folks, we do have strep pyogenes um, here in Lillard Hall, um, try to keep your hands away from your face because that's a great way for them to gain access. And try to wash your hands as frequently as you can. Um, the, the streptococcus pyogenes, it can be shed in respiratory secretions, so sneezing and coughing, and it's just in your saliva too. And I've noticed, you guys, this is gross, I know, but I've noticed sometimes just when I talk, like sometimes there's a little spittle that goes out there. So if I had strep pyogenes, the bacterium would be in that little sal saliva droplets, and wherever it lands, since they're gram-positive bacteria, they can probably remain infectious for, I'm guessing, at least a day. So you, you need to be careful of the surfaces your hands are coming in contact with. Keep them away from your face. Make sure you wash your hands a lot. And that's probably one of the best ways to stay healthy. Wash your hands a lot and keep your hands away from your face. Okay. All right, folks. So let's take a look at our handout again. Let's take a look at, um, let's see your, um, last time, folks, we talked about sabrodextrose <laughs> as being selective for fungi. Um, we talked about mannitol salt auger as being selective for salt tolerant microbes, such as who? Yeah, the members of the genus Staphylococcus that have evolved to live on our salty skin, right? So we said MSA is selective, right, for salt tolerant microbes, and specifically we're looking for members of the genus Staphylococcus. And folks, there's two members of the genus Staphylococcus that um, we might frequently grow on, on MSA from clinical samples. One of them is called Staphylococcus epidermidis, and this is a commensal. Probably all of us are colonized with it on our skin. So this is a cousin of Staphylococcus aureus. It's called Staphylococcus epidermidis. And the specific epithet you guys is telling us it lives where? On the skin, right? And usually, folks, unless you're immunocompromised, Usually, um, Staphylococcus epidermidis truly is a commensal, meaning it benefits living on us, but it usually doesn't hurt us, nor do we benefit um, from it, right? So we usually don't, we're not that worried about it unless your patient is immunocompromised, right? Um, as we said, common skin inhabitant, probably of all of us, yeah? But then, in contrast, you guys, there's its cousin, and I'm gonna label it as a, a pathogen, um, because it's so much more aggressive Staphylococcus aureus. Aureus comes from the fact that on certain types of media it will form golden colonies, yellow golden colonies. And folks, we are worried about Staphylococcus aureus because it's much, it's a it's a really efficient tissue invader. And we'll see when we get to the medical micro unit in um, lecture. It has so many what we call virulence factors. And you guys, I'm just sorry, I just realized I didn't plug in the microphone. Apologies. Okay. I'm hoping the internal mic might have picked up some of this. Okay. So again, folks, we're talking about mannitol salt auger, and we're talking about two species of the genus Staphylococcus, Staphylococcus epidermidis, that can um, live as a commensal on our skin, and then the more virulent Staphylococcus aureus. So again, folks, in comparing the Staphylococcus epidermidis, unless you're like immunocompromised or some reason your defenses are lowered, gesundheit. We don't worry so much about it. Um, it usually isn't resistant to multiple antibiotics, even if it does cause an infection. In contrast, Staphylococcus aureus has great potential for tissue invasion. It can be highly virulent, cause a lot of damage. And furthermore, often it's resistant to multiple antibiotics. So folks, let's say you take a pus sample, maybe from an abscess from a patient, right? And of course, you're always worried about Staph aureus. So you plate to your mannitol salt auger plates, right? And you incubate them, you come in the next day and there's colonies growing, right? So the question is, um, could we distinguish, could we differentiate from, uh, between Staphylococcus epidermidis and Staphylococcus aureus growing on the plate? And what makes MSA um, media so wonderful, you guys, it is differential, it's gonna let us it's going to let us differentiate staph epi from staph aureus um, from the way the colonies are growing on the plate. So let me grab our MSA plate. It's out of the real fridge. 
And this will take a little background, folks. Okay, so when we're talking about differential media, remember, differential media lets us distinguish or differentiate between different types of microbes growing on our medium. And there's different mechanisms for this. One mechanism is to include um, some fermentable substrate and ask the question, you know, can the microbe ferment the substrate or can the microbe not ferment the substrate? Now, usually the substrates we provide our microbes in these differential media is usually a sugar or some kind of sugar alcohol, so that if the microbes ferment the sugar or sugar alcohol, they're going to make acids. And what will happen to the pH? If they make acids, the pH will go down, right? So if we incorporate a pH indicator, something that will change appearance, change color at different pHs, we put that in the media, then we can get a quick differential, um, differential ID between two different types of microbes based on their ability to ferment this sugar, sugar, alcohol, or not ferment it. Okay. So again, folks, this is the basis of the um, mannitol salt auger is a differential media. The reason it's called mannitol salt auger is it has a, um, a sugar alcohol, mannitol, incorporated into the me medium. So if microbes can ferment mannitol, right, they're gonna drop the, they'll make acids, they'll drop the pH, right? So the way we're gonna detect that is by incorporating a pH indicator. And the one we incorporate, you guys, in mannitol salt auger is called phenol red. And phenol red, you guys, the pH, pH indicator is so much fun, they change colors. I always love that. So you guys, it, uh, with phenol red, at acidic pH, it turns yellow, and at alkaline pH, it'll be a dark red. Sometimes it's called fuchsia, right? So, okay, it's like, all right, all right, so what, so what? So you guys, so it turns out um, Staphylococcus epidermidis, it cannot ferment mannitol. So it can't ferment mannitol. So we say it's mannitol negative, So we call we call it mannitol negative. Can't ferment mannitol. But the question is, it still needs a carbon energy source. So if it can't ferment, if it can't use the mannitol, what can it use? So what it will use instead for carbon and energy are amino acids. And when amino acids are torn apart, when the amino group is released, it's released as ammonia. And what do we know about ammonia, you guys, with regard to pH? It's a weak base, right? So it'll bind hydrogen ions. So what's gonna happen to the pH, you guys, if amino acids are torn apart? Will the pH go down or go up? It'll go up, right? We'll get an alkaline reaction, yeah? So you guys, so if we're growing um, Saf epi on our mannitol salt auger plates, it can ferment the mannitol, it attacks amino acids, release ammonia, the pH goes up, and at alkaline pH, you guys, what color is phenol red? Red, yeah. So you guys, here we have mannitol salt auger, and we see we have good growth, you guys, of our salt-tolerant salt staphylococcus. So which species do you think this is? Staphylococcus epidermidis, right? Right, okay. So in contrast, folks, Staphylococcus aureus can ferment mannitol. Ferments mannitol, so we call it mannitol positive. Spell mannitol right? No, I didn't. Two N, sorry, you guys. I misspelled mannitol. So, Staph aureus ferments mannitol. So, we call it, I'll put M A N N positive, right? So, you guys, when it ferments the mannitol, what will be produced? Acids, right? What will happen to the pH when the acids are produced? It's gonna go down, okay? And you guys, what color will phenol red, the pH indicator, turn at acidic pH? Yellow. So you guys, let's say this is an abscess from another patient. You inoculated your mannitol salt auger with a swab of the pus, and you incubated, and you go and pull out of the incubator the next day. Are you worried? Yeah, why are you worried? Yeah, now how did you know that? I agree with you. This is Staphylococcus aureus. How did you guys know that? 
Okay, it's grown on a mannitol salt auger, right? You know it's salt tolerant. Good chance it's a member of the genus Staphylococcus. But how did you know it's Staph aureus and not Staph epidermidis? Okay, so the auger just turned <coughs> yellow. Why did the auger turn yellow? The acid pH. Okay, what's the pH indicator? Phenol red, right, turns yellow at acidic pH. Why did the auger turn, excuse me, why, um, why did we get acids produced? From fermentation of the mannitol, right? And who can ferment mannitol? Staph aureus. Good. Does this make sense, you guys? It's a lot. It's kind of like you have to come up and play with the plates and kind of quiz yourself back and forth. Okay. So, you guys, if um, this is patient one, an abscess, this is uh, a pus, swab to MSA, incubated, you pull it out. Who do you think this is? Staph epidermidis. Are you worried? Well, not horribly worried, right? Because we know staph epi, it's not very aggressive, and it's usually not resistant to multiple antibiotics. Okay, but patient two, you guys, same scenario, another pus sample. Are you more worried for patient two? Why? This looks like we have a Staphylococcus aureus infection. So what? Why are you worried? Very aggressive tissue invader, often resistant to multiple antibiotics. So does that make sense, folks? Okay, good. Also, you guys, I just had a thought. Um, gosh, we should maybe do this next semester. Could we, out of curiosity, you know, we did the nasal swabs, right? We said Staph aureus likes to live in our nose. Maybe 10, 15, 20% of us might carry Staph aureus in our nose, and it's living as a commensal, right? It's not causing harm, right? But if we're working in a hospital, say we're working in a burn ward or in a, a ward for an oncology ward, right, with a lot of our patients are immunocompromised, could we act as a reservoir of Staph aureus to infect our patients? Yeah. So you guys, so if we had an outbreak of Staph aureus in your hospital, could you do nasal swabs and then um, inoculate your MSA plates for a quick screen of folks? Yeah. So if if there's somebody that has a lot of um, yellow colonies growing right from their nasal swan on MSA, you'd want to follow up to see the major <coughs> colonies with Staph aureus, right? And again, you guys, this would be just like if you're having a maybe a problems with Staph aureus outbreaks among, amongst your patients, hospital acquired Staph aureus infections, right? Okay, does that make sense, folks? Okay, I'll keep the sample plates, you guys, up here, the MSA plates. We'll keep up here kind of in line with the concept map, all right? Okay, folks, so the last one we're going to talk about, this is a little bit more complicated. The last um, media differential, um, selective and differential media we're going to talk about, folks, is called McConkie's auger or MAC. And on page two of your handout, you'll see they're under selective. You'll see that McConkie's has been listed as a selective medium. And um, McConkie's, folks, is used to select for gram-negative enteric bacteria. Enteric referring to microbes that can live in the intestinal tract, right? And specifically, you guys, we're, we're looking for, so with McConkie's, it's going to select for gram-negative bacteria that belong to this big family this big family of bacteria called the entero entero refers to intestines entero and indeed you guys most of the gram negative bacteria we work with uh, we work with here in our lab, most of them do belong to this big family. The most famous, the f most famous member is good old E. coli. But we'll discover E. coli has many cousins, for example, Enterobacter, um, Serratia, and you don't need to memorize these, you guys, it's just these are some of the ones that we work with in our lab. Um, we don't work with Salmonella in our lab because it is, it's, a, it's a pathogen. Nor do we work with Shigella, the 
cause of basilary dysentery, nor do we work with Yersinia. Yersinia pestis causes which disease? Bubonic plague. So it's probably good we're not working with those here, right? But certainly, you guys, in our lab, we'll be working with some of these lower, lower virulent Enterobacteriaceae, E. coli, Enterobacter, and Serratia. Okay, well, who cares? Well, remember how we say we said you guys Enterobacteriaceae, entero means intestines, and indeed, you guys, sometimes these guys are called the enterics, or their ability to live in the intestines, say, of mammals. Yeah, okay. So let's take E. coli, folks. So do you think we're all colonized with E. coli in our intestines? Yep, we all are, right? Most mammals are. And folks, um, there's many, many different strains of E. coli. So the good beneficial ones living in your intestines, they're not making toxins, they're not causing harm as long as they stay in your intestines, right? We'll learn in lecture um, that there are different strains of E. coli and some of them make powerful toxins which can kill us, right? So we need to remember that there's many, many different varieties of E. coli. Okay, all right, so we're gonna put that on the back burner. And now, folks, we're gonna pretend we're public health microbiologists. And we've been asked into a community because there's an outbreak of diarrheal disease and there's suspicion that either drinking water or food has been contaminated with what? Feces, right? Okay, so we're trying to find out, you know, is it some well water contaminated? Is, is it some food contaminated? So we're gonna be screening lots and lots of water samples, lots of food samples, right? Now you guys, let's think about what kind of pathogens could be in feces. Why do we worry about fecal contamination? So you guys, could you name two viruses that could be found in feces that could be transmitted fecal orally by fecal contaminated food? Can you name two viruses that might be transmitted through fecal contaminated food? Polio virus, right? Another one is hepatitis A virus, right? Is fecal oral transmission, okay. So we're worried if feces is contaminated the water or food. I mean, it, there could be polio, there could be hepatitis A virus, there's a whole bunch of other viruses, right? Folks, could you name two bacterial pathogens that could be present in fecal contaminated food or water? Campylobacter, remember, Thanksgiving's coming up, raw turkey, you don't want to invite Campylobacter to your Thanksgiving dinner, but Campylobacter fecal, fecal contamination can spread it. Who else? Salmonella, again, another great uh, Thanksgiving day turkey barn pathogen, Salmonella. Okay. Shigella. This, this E. coli, you guys, 0157A7, we'll be discussing it um, in, in future labs and lectures. It's a toxin producing strain of E. coli that can cause really serious harm. It can be lethal in little kids. Vibrio cholera, you guys, ca causes the bacterial disease cholera, right? And Listeria monocytogenes. Remember Listeria, you guys, said it can be found in raw milk products, right? That's be that can also be fecal oral. Folks, can you think of two um, intestinal protozoal parasites that can be transmitted by fecal oral transmission? The cysts would be present in feces. So who could be present in fecal contaminated water? <coughs> could it be Giardia? Okay, and who else did we study that would could have cysts in the feces? And to be the histolytica. Good. Okay. Can you think of any worm aches that might be present in fecal contaminated food or water? Ascaris aches and who else? Tenosolium, right? Okay. And you guys, this is just a partial list of the pathogens that could be present in feces, right? Feces is such a rich source of pathogens. And this is why we're so worried about fecal contamination or food or water. It's not just ooh, poo, right? It's because all these pathogens could be present. But folks, can you imagine? It would be so expensive. It would take so much time to screen food and water samples for all these pathogens. It, it would be almost impossible, right? So what the public health microbiologists decided many years ago, they said, if we're gonna screen food and water for fecal contamination, let's decide on a microbe that should always be present in feces, a microbe that's easy to grow and easy to identify, right? And so the microbe they chose, you guys, was E. coli. So we call it E. coli 
our our indicator of fecal contamination. So what this means, folks, is if we find high numbers of E. coli in food or drinking water, high concentrations of E. coli in food or drinking water, we're presuming the food or water is contaminated with what? Feces, right? And folks, it's not just that we're worried about the E. coli in there, we're worried that the fecal contamination could have any of those other pathogens present, right? So we would want to you know, put a call out and say, you know, stop drinking this water or stop eating this food, right, because of the fecal and then you do an investigation and find out why is it getting contaminated with feces, right? Okay. All right, folks. So this is the key idea is that E. coli is going to be our indicator organism of fecal contamination. This is really a key idea. So what would be really nice if we're screening hundreds of samples to have um, selective media that would select for the growth of enterics like E. coli. So like other environmental microbes won't grow, right? And furthermore, it'd be nice if it was a differential media that would give us a hint that this is E. coli growing on the plate and not one of its other cousins. Yeah. So you guys, so, so McConkie's then, if we turn to page three, okay, and up at the top, you guys, it should read differential media. It got cut off. The title got cut off on the previous page. So if you put differential media up here, right? So McConkie's media, folks, is differential based on the ability to ferment lactose. So here's our Marconkies here. It's differential based on lactose fermentation. Okay. And I forgot, you guys, I apologize. The reason Marconkies is um, selective is that it's going to inhibit the growth of gram-positive bacteria and non-enteric bacteria because it includes two inhibitors. It includes bile salts, which will inhibit bacteria that haven't evolved to live in the intestinal tract, and it contains crystal violet, which will inhibit the growth of gram-positive bacteria. Okay, so those are the two inhibitors. But now with all of these enterics, you guys, we want to try to um, differentiate between possible E. coli and the other cousins there. So what we're going to do is we're only going to include one sugar in our McConkie's auger. We're only going to include lactose. And lactose is an unusual sugar, you guys. Where in nature do we find lactose? Who makes lactose? Only, yeah, only mammals, right? We're called mammals because we have mammary glands because we make milk for our babies, right? So um, E. coli has evolved to live in the intestinal tract of mammals. So would we guess, you guys, that E. coli makes lactose transfer pro proteins and makes beta-galactosidase to break down lactose so then it can feed it into glycolysis. Yeah, remember the lack operon, you guys? Yeah. So we could say E. coli is kind of unusual in that it makes beta-galactosidase, right? It can use lactose as a carbon and energy source. So with McConkie's, you guys, we're going to use lactose fermentation as our way to differentiate two big groups of the enterics, the lactose fermenting bacteria, which includes E. coli, and the lactose non-fermenting bacteria, which includes like Salmonella, Shigella, and Yersinia. Okay, now how the heck are we going to do that? Well, we know we only have lactose as the only sugar in McConkie's, so we need to have um, something that will tell us whether acids are produced or not. And in um, in our McConkie's media, folks, the the pH indicator is called neutral red. And neutral red is going to turn pink or red at acidic pH, and it will be colorless at alkaline pH. Okay? So, you guys, what's going to happen if e, if e. coli or one of its um, cousins ferments lactose? What are we going to make? Acids, right? What will happen to the pH? pH will drop, right? What will happen to the neutral red? It turns pink or red, okay? tear apart amino acids as an alternate source of carbon and energy. So you guys, when we tear apart amino acids and release the amino group, we release the amino group as 
ammonia, we base, so what's going to happen to pH? It's going to go up, right? So remember, you guys, at acidic pH, neutral red is going to be pink or red, and at alkaline pH, it will be colorless. Okay, so you guys, so this is a McConkie's auger plate inoculated with two different enterics. Which side, let's hear, I'm sorry, we should do like this, you guys. So side A and side B, which side do you think has E. coli, our lactose fermenter, growing on it? A or B? A, good. You see that, you guys, the neutral red? It's, there's so much acid being made, it actually precipitates in the auger. See how pink the auger is there? And over here, you guys, this is another enteric that can ferment lactose. So it's tearing apart amino acids pH goes up, the neutral red is colorless, right? So there's no, no pink relative to this site. So we know lactose negative, this could be salmonella, shigella, yersinia, it's not either of those, but anyway, just so you know. And over here, this is our lactose fermenting bacterium, could be E. coli, yeah. So you guys, if we had 10 water samples, say from 10 different wells, and we inoculated McConkie's media and incubated them, and five of the samples had lots and lots and lots of pink colonies, why do we worry about the water samples that, that are growing pink colonies? Who could those be? E. coli. So why are we worried? It might mean that those water sources are contaminated with feces. Who cares? Yeah, yeah we should all worry because who knows what, what intestinal fecal pathogens are present. Does that make sense, you guys? Okay, all right. So folks, what we'll do, I'll leave the MSA plates up here for you to take a peek at, uh, sort of in line with our mannitol salt concept now. Yeah, yes, yes. No, it's awesome. That's, you just nailed it. You just totally nailed it. If there's a lot of E. coli present, that's telling you, hmm, looks like we have fecal contamination. If we have fecal contamination, we could have polio virus, hepatitis A virus, norovirus. We could have Salmonella, Shigella, Listeria, Campylobacter. We could have Giardia. We could have Enteritis allergicus cysts. We could have Ascrosades and Tinea soleumates. So you're just you just tell the community stop, stop drinking that water, stop eating that food because there's fecal contamination and who knows what could be present. Does that make sense? Yeah, awesome. Good job, you guys. All right, and then what we'll do, folks, is um, I'll move the blood auger plates. And you guys, again, don't don't open these. You can hold them up to the light to see the awesome um, alpha and beta hemolysis. And then, truly, you guys, just wash your hands afterwards. We'll put the blood auger plates, you guys, over here with our blood auger concept map. And then here, you guys, with the McConkies. Let me let me clear a space. And we'll put our McConkie demo plates up here for you to take a peek at. Okay. And my thought was, you guys, this weekend, I'll try to work up some sample, um, clinical samples, um, and post them on Canvas. So it would be practice, like how we would use our selective and differential media um, in diagnosing, you know, a particular problem. And we'll put those on Canvas. And those would be really similar to the lab exam two type questions we would set up. Again, we like to use clinical cases, you know, application um, scenarios on the lab exam too, so you can practice. Okay, does that make sense, folks? Okay. And then furthermore, do remember you guys that it does help if you can, trying to kind of stay caught up on your lab packet two um, homework study guide questions. And remember folks that the chapter 10 questions start on page two, we go page two, page three. Um, on on page four, you guys, um, the colony descriptions. We're going to pull our airborne plates Tuesday, and we're going to have you describe two of the colonies on your airborne plates, and we're going to learn all the different um, descriptive terms we do for that. So we'll do this next week on Tuesday. And then, folks, on page five, there's a table here kind of to help you get ready for the lab exam, too. So you're identifying the functional type of the media. If it's selective media, you're identifying the inhibitors. You need to know what's inhibited, what, what will grow, what you select for. And if the medium is differential, understanding 
um, how the medium is differential, how would different microbes appear, um, what are the differential ingredients, so just a table to kind of help organize your thoughts. And then down at the bottom there, you guys, this whole discussion on um, E. coli is an indicator of fecal contamination. That is a key concept, you guys, that E. coli is an indicator of fecal contamination. So if you're having trouble kind of digesting that, aha, uh -huh, no, all right, just, just keep asking, okay? Keep asking questions. And then, folks, it finishes on page six on blood auger, okay? And good. Now, folks, with regard to what we're doing um, next week, and I apologize, I didn't get the handouts made in time. But um, on. So on Tuesday, we're going to. Um, do, it looks like a lot, you guys, but the hands on is actually really short. I'm thinking we'll probably finish in an hour, which is probably good because then you'll get out of lab early and just have a chance to kind of um, gather your thoughts before the lecture exam. We're going to do a demo on bacterial motility, which is chapter nine. We're gonna do just one simple aseptic transfer of bacteria from one place to another. Oops, aseptic, aseptic. Aseptic transfer. And then folks, we're gonna do, um, we're gonna teach you how to streak a plate to isolate bacteria using um, streak plates. So again, folks, it looks like a lot, but the hands-on, probably including our, our introduction, the actual hands-on, I bet you will be completed in about an hour. So it won't be as intense as it looks like. And, and indeed, folks, what, what we would do, <coughs> I forgot to mention this in the um, previous labs, is that we're gonna um, check the airborne plates. So we're gonna be counting colonies, counting the um, total number of colonies, counting the different varieties of colony, and then you're gonna choose two colonies to describe the colony morphologies, right? But still, again, you guys, it should be pretty short, pretty short next week. Do bring your PPE. So from now on, you guys, the rest of the labs, the rest of the labs till the end of the semester, every week will need PPE. So just keep it here, right? Um, and we will have a handout. So I'll have a hard copy of the handout. I put, the, I wrote the handout. Well, actually what I did was I took Dr. Holland's amazing lab notes. She has the best lab notes. And I just added protocols, like this is how we're gonna do the aseptic transfer, this is how we're gonna do the isolation. So I posted that on Canvas and I'll have a hard copy for you on Tuesday, okay? And then just so I don't forget, open lab, you guys, is tomorrow 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Um, there was a request to do like kind of practice quiz questions. I'll record it on movie and post it on Canvas so everybody will have access to it. Okay. So folks, any questions that we have? So really today it's just a matter of looking at the um, demo mannitol salt plates, looking at the demo McConkie's plates, looking at the demo blood honor plates, right? And thinking about, um, is this medium all-purpose, enrichment, selective, or differential? What will I grow? How would I distinguish what type of micro from another? Okay, so it's really light. And again, folks, like we said, when you're finished, you can leave early. Make sure you wash your hands, you guys. I'm just going to tell you, wash your hands all the time. You can leave early to go study elsewhere. If you want to stay here, or just use it as an open lab. I'll be here to answer any kind of lecture and two questions. Okay, all right, thanks.